It is a particular honor to invite as our spec first speaker of the conference, uh, Professor Paul Mendes Flohr, who is a leading scholar of modern Jewish thought. As an intellectual historian, Mendel's floor specializes in 19th and 20th century Jewish thinkers, including Martin Buber, Franz Rosenzweig, Gershom Scholem, and Leo Strauss. Mendel's floor holds a doctorate from Brandeis University, which was supervised by Alexander Altman, Nahum Glatzner, and Ben Alperin. Uh, what a pleasure it is to see this lineage. Mendes Flohr taught at the University of Chicago, where he is Dorothy Grant McClear Professor Emeritus of Modern Jewish History and Thought. He is also a Professor Emeritus of Jewish Thought at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And we are extremely pleased to invite you to open the conference. I tend to speak softly. I hope this works. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to thank Al uh, Alona for the gracious invitation to participate in, in the conference and to honor the, uh, the, not only the architectural legacy of Mendelssohn, but the ethical, but to honor not only the architectural legacy of Mendelssohn, but his ethical and particularly his vision of Arab Jewish or Arab Israeli um, fraternity cooperation. I'll begin with a citation in, in German. Man kann die Ko keine Kultur mit der Politik machen, aber man kann Politik mit der Kultur machen. One cannot create culture with politics, but one can make politics with culture. This epigraph drawn from the writings of the first president of the Federal Republic of Germany, Teda Hoyce, raises a wall of the Salvini Platz Espan station in Berlin. It expresses an attitude distinctive of Central European intellectuals. And the epigraph I just read, I'll repeat it in English. One cannot create culture with politics, but one can make politics with culture. This epigraph, drawn from the writings of the first president of the Federal Republic of Germany, Theodor Heuss graces a wall of the Savini Platz S-Bahn station in Berlin. It expresses an attitude distinctive of Central European intellectuals, especially in the years prior to the Second World War. It is an attitude that assumes a su the superiority, supremacy excuse me, of Kultur, with its unique access to the realm of the spirit, Geist and humanity's most elevated ideals and values. As opposed to politics, beholden as it is to the calculating dictates of civilization, civilization and a lust for power. Though often draped in the language of politics, this attitude reflects a profound ambivalence towards public affairs, a wariness about the wiles of government that reaches back to the German of Cleo, Enlightenment, when the likes of Kant declared that mor morality and politics, morality and politics were mutually exclusive, a view later echoed by the poet Goethe, when he exclaimed, and I quote, "The man of action is always without conscience." This attitude was particularly characteristic of those the historian Fritz Rigner called the German Mandarins a self-conscious elite who regarded themselves by virtue of their education and culture as the bearers of the pristine, the pure and noble values of society. In Zionist circles, this attitude was a first or elegantly articulated. In Zionist circles, this attitude was perhaps most elegantly articulated by Martin Buber, who, reluct who recurrently called upon the movement to adopt a kulturpolitik, a program to renew Jewish life and institutions by, re by a re reformation of Jewish aesthetic 
and cultural sensibilities. Although often perceived as a German Jew, Buber was in fact a Polish Jew, as Gershom Scholem was wont to uh, remind us with a palpable measure of derision. Raised in Galicia, the East European province of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, where he received a traditional Jewish education and attended a Polish gymnasium. Indeed, his first publications were in Polish, including a stillborn <coughs> translation of Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra, which he undertook at the age of 16. Nietzsche's call for the transvaluation of values would leave its mark on his, Buber's, understanding of Kulturpolitik. Nietzsche introduced the young Buber to the Swiss historian in cul of culture. Okay. okay. Well, this is going to be more difficult now. Okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Nietzsche introduced the young Buber to the Swiss historian of, cul and cul of culture and art, Jakob Burkhardt. For Buber's Zionist vision evolved, as Buber's Zionist vision evolved, it would in fact be guided by Burkhardt's conception of culture, and especially as it informed the Italian Renaissance. For Burkhardt, a culture embraces the totality of a people's spiritual life and self understanding. In addition to religion, a culture is constituted by the life of the intellect, art, and literature. Accordingly, one should appreciate the far-reaching significance of the Italian Renaissance as affecting a seismic cultural transition from the cultural somnolence, sleepiness, if you wish, of the Middle Ages to the modern period in which the individual emerges as a self-conscious creative agent in determining his or her destiny and inner spiritual life as well as an agent of cultural creation. In an off-sighted passage from Burkhardt's most renowned work, The Civilization of, of, the civilization of Renaissance in, again, the civilization of Renaissance in Italy, published in 1860, which later Buber would have translated into Hebrew, he depicts, Burkhardt depicts this process in the terms that were surely resonant for a young man eager to find a place in the modern world and free of the claims of one's primordial affiliations. Burkhardt argued that by... In an off-sighted passage from Burkhardt's most renowned work, The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, which later Buber would have translated into Hebrew, he depicts this process in terms that were surely resonant for a young man such as Buber, eager to find his place in the, modern, in the modern world and free of the claims of one's primordial affiliations. Burkhardt argued that by removing the veil of corporate, collective identities, woven, quote, woven of faith, childhood, childlike prejudices, and illusion, the Italian Renaissance had initiated the liberation of the individual and thereby paved the way for the passage into the modern world. The term Renaissance came to connote rebirth, a reawakening of the creative spirit of the individual that has been characteristic of the individual in antiquity, but sadly eclipsed by the, the Middle Ages. While still a graduate student at the University of Berlin, Buber would introduce into the Zionist lexicon a vision of a Jewish renaissance, individual and collective rebirth. The 22-year-old Buber proclaimed were dialectically interrelated, for Buber's Zionism was to serve as the fulcrum for the spiritual rebirth of the Jew, whose culturally creative impulses were stifled by the torment of 2,000 years of exile that allowed the so-called custodians of Judaism the rabbis to shackle the Jews with chains of a senseless tradition. Those were citations. And he would later put it, as he would later put it in an address to Jewish youth uh, students in Prague, Zionism understood the liberation of the scourge of exile, Galut, to be a personal task of every individual, well, every individual Jew, 
It was especially the mission of the Jewish youth to tap anew the creative spiritual pathos of Judaism that alas remained dormant in Israel's bimennial sojourn in Galut, exile. Vahub suppressed under the weight of the halakha, Jewish rabbinic law, the primordial foundational creative spiritual impulses of the people somehow continues to glow deep within the soul of the Jew, embers crying to be rekindled. Turning to the university students who invited him, Buber, to, to come to Prague and to guide them back to Judaism, from which they felt deeply estranged and deracinated, uprooted. Buber encouraged each of them to look back, and I'm quoting again, upon his life, her life, and inside it, and to discern the vestiges of the biblical Israel's creative force. Whoever realizes the pathos of his inner energy, her inner energy, inner energy will discover that there still lie, lives within him or her an element whose great national prototype is the strength of the prophets against the people's straying inclinations. End of citation. This primal, alas, but latent spiritual force will be distinguished as religiosity as opposed to religion, religion, which renders God an, an abstraction. Buttress, buttress by, or reinforce if you wish, by dogma, rules, and cult. And again, I cite Buber. We know that a distinctive Jewish religiosity, again as distinct from the religion, did not, did not exist, did once exist. It existed in the age of the, that let Jacob wrestle with, the, with God for his blessing, and in the age that Moses died with the kiss of God, and in the age in which 18th century Hasidism dared to forge God's terrestrial, worldly destiny. And the quote, we with us ask rhetorically, why are we, the denizens, the citizens, if you wish, of, of the modern age, still Jews? Out of adherence? Adherence out of, out of loyalty? Adherence out of pride? Adherence out of inertia, as a stone falling through space adheres in its direction? Do we affirm ourselves Jews merely as out of defiance, trotz Juden? resisting the insidious allure of assimilation and the scorn of anti-Semitism, and with it a defiant pride to, to proclaim ourselves as a belonging to the Jewish nation. No, but we, we were exclaimed, would readily acknowledge that adherence to a Jewish identity solely out of the ethnic fidelity is bereft of living substance. Our Judaism must surely be eminently more than merely remembered suffering and a remembered image, like traces, years, and fate have left on the face. It, may, it must be something else. We are, after all, the children of prophets, the psalmists, the kings of Judah, who embodied a primal religiosity, a spiritual sensibility that attested to the Asi quote, to, mind you, Asiatic genius, which biblical Israel shared with the likes of Lao Tzu and Buddha, who taught that we are to strive to realize a unity between an inner spiritual experience and the way we live in the world. The Tao, as the Chinese sage Lao Tzu would put it. It is also the age, Asia of Moses and the, age, and the Asia of Isaiah, of Jesus and Paul. Buba cites a midrash, a, a rabbinic homily, attesting to Israel's Asiatic perspective, and I quote, and this is uh, Genesis Rabbah, only by being undivided will you have a share in, in the Lord your God. The office of Midrash, so Buber, would indeed, um, excuse me, the office of Midrash, so Buber, envisioned a world in which dualism, the manifestation separation of good and evil, will be abolished. A world in which deeds to be realized in both the life of the individual and the life of the community. A world of unity. Again, that was a citation. We would elaborate this vision in an essay of 1913, duly entitled, and I quote, The Spirit of the Orient and Judaism. 
despite the ravishments of exile, galut, gnawing at the soul of the Jew, the Jew has remained an Orient. And I kind of quote, drawn out of his, drawn, driven, excuse me, out of his land and dispersed throughout the lands of the Occident, the Western world, she, the, the Jew, was forced to dwell under the sky she did not know, and on the soil she did not till. She has suffered martyrdom, worse than martyrdom, a life of degradation, the ways of the nations among which she lived have affected her, and she had spoken their language. Yet, despite all this, she has remained an Oriental. Buber concludes with a resounding Zionist message, articulating his cultural politique. Once the soul of a Jew comes into contact with his maternal soil in Eretz Israel, it will once, once more become creative. The Jews can truly fulfill this. Now he goes. In. The Jews can truly fulfill their vocation among the nations only when they begin anew, and with the, their whole undiminished, purified, original strength, the German is all craft, translates into reality with his religious or their religiosity. taught to him or them in antiquity. Rooted in his native soil, the Jew will resume the pri his primordial task to be, and I can quote, the Orient's apostle to the nations, ex oriental lux. Buber's addresses in Prague, speeches in Prague, will become the Veda Mechum, something he always holds in your pocket, so to speak, of a generation of Central European Jewish youth among whom was Eric Mendelssohn. As a disciple of Buber's spiritual Zionism, Mendelssohn would seek an indigenous Palestinian architectural idiom, or Arabic idiom if you wish, to enhance the creation of a Semitic Zionist identity. According, according to Said Alona, <laughs> the magisterial study of Mendelssohn's architectural vision rested upon a collaboration of, between Arabs and Jews whose kinship dated back to the biblical times. Fervent for Mendelssohn as forged by, the Arab -Jewish, by an Arab-Jewish uh, spiritual alliance, the Zionist project would be, again, the site of Elona, if I may, uh, a quote, a, spring a springboard for a global political reconstruction. The successful implementation of the Zionist project, so, so conceived, quote again, would inaugurate a new world order. An, architect, an architecture would be its expression, expressive medium. Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn's understanding of the artist as a spiritual leader bears the imprint of, of Buber's Zionist and continued to do so as Buber refined his thought refracted through the prism of the philosophy of dialogue. With the publication of Ishindu, Ani in 1923, Buber softened his sermonic lapidary style for a more religious, rigorous and a little exp exposition. Yet the presuppositions of his Orientalism remained, albeit captured couch now in new conceptual vocabulary. He would expect, expect, explicate his concept of I vow relations with extensive references to Eastern faiths, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism. In contrast, I vow relations construe one's fellow human beings as objects defined by positivistic epistemological categories, thus also foster and also, thus also forced the concepts of human well-being measured by technological progress and a hedonistic materialism that promotes an avaricious excuse me, imperialism which plunders Asia and its doings crushes its soul. Such views were passionately echoed by Eric Mendelssohn 
in his quest for an architectural idiom representing a spiritual renewal of Judaism, true to its oriental. Such views were passionately echoed by Eric Mendelssohn in his quest for an architectural idiom representing a spiritual renewal of Judaism, true to its oriental patrimony origins. Upon his emigration to Palestine in 1935, the architect Julius Posner and a former associate Mendel of Mendel's Berliner office met his mentor in Jerusalem. In recalling his meeting in Rechavia's famed windmill, in which Mendelssohn had set up his office, his studio, excuse me, and living quarters, Posner reports, and I quote, you could imagine the scene of two German Jews are sitting in a windmill in Jerusalem, listening to Beethoven's Song of Thanksgiving. This was not simply a piece of beautiful music that expresses the joy and gratitude for the gift of life. To us, Beethoven was the greatest, the most intimate spiritual and thus significance that we sought. We are in Palestine, pondering how we, two Jews in this land where we have our origins, our ancestral origins, can each should build after the Arabs who have inhabited this land for a thousand years and have built on it its on it so compellingly in their own way. In an essay written in Hebrew on the artist and architect Leopold of Karkawa and his drawings of the Jerusalem landscape, Buber speaks of the dialectical tension between Krakauer's art and architecture, noting that Krakauer, who emigrated to Palestine in 1924, identified with, with what he perceived to be the solitude of the gnarled olive trees that punctuate the hills of the holy city. Buber speaks of, and I quote, the depth of Krakauer's experience in the anguish of solitude that was the driving force for his graphic art, while his buildings derived from a longing for the cordial life of friendship. These two elements were to be found together in his soul, as the soul of so many other artists and writers in the pre of present time, particularly in this country, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. A tendency of to melancholy and a, and a longing for the companionship which together have fashioned their creative work. These observations apply to Eric Mendelssohn, whose years in Jerusalem were indeed marked by an anguished solitude and a melancholy, or excuse me, a melancholic ever longing for a spiritual home in Zion. Uh, thank you.